Hello and welcome to Murder with Friends, the show where two friends get together and talk about the darker sides of history. I'm your host, Grace Baldridge, and joining me today is comedian and my dear friend, Anya Malik. Anya, welcome to my creepy little show. What's up? Are we, the, can we, no, hug? we don't we, hug. We don't we hug? Just, oh. I just like go like that, but it does do from feel across like the way. It, yeah, it could have been a hug. Damn. Um, I'm so excited to have you here. Please, for people that are not familiar with who you are and what you do, could you just describe how we know each other and what sort of comedy they can get from you? Uh, I'm a master comedian. <laughs> uh, we we met while uh, I was mastering the comedy, yep. and you were like, "Wow, so masterful!" You 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 know what I mean? You, Unfortunately, uh, that is that's, that's totally accurate. true. That's I happened. saw you perform and came up to you afterwards and was like. How are you so funny? <laughs> Teach me your ways. Yeah. And like, I sent you an email. Yeah. Oh, that's so weird. Um, what can people see of yours right now? Uh, right now, got an album out on iTunes and all the other stuff. Uh, it's called Pop Grits. Mm -hmm. It's my latest album mm -hmm. of three. Um, oh, cool. Yeah, yeah. Pop Grits on iTunes. Uh, it's a priceless work of art. Amazing. Yes. Uh, um, so when we talked about doing the show together, we talked about a number of different cases that we might want to cover. And uh, two figures that you suggested that I thought would be kind of interesting are the unsolved murders of Biggie Smalls, the Notorious B.I.G., and Tupac Shakur, which is what we'll be talking about on today's show. So for someone who had never heard of who these two people were before, how would you sort of briefly describe their life and legacy? Tupac and Biggie were the embodiment of 90s rap. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, their feud changed rap feuds forever. They, they are, they're the, the most interesting figures in hip hop. Mm -hmm. You know, their their rise to success and ultimate demise. You know, even the unsolved. You know, even the the you know the mystery around their case is so much commentary about the culture and the, the capture at that time in their cases. And you know, uh, Tupac was he was an artist that was like really had like a human range, like a really, really dope rapper that could tell the story, not only just in the streets, but like, you know, the story of other people, you know, in the streets. When I say streets, and when people hear streets, they're like, yo, these dudes shooting guns and, and dope dealing, but it's like on a more perspective level, you mm -hmm. know, and not just this, the street characters that's, you know, right. shooting guns and dope dealing, but like people walking on their way to school or like people having babies or like, you know, uh, torn relationship between him him and his mother or, mm -hmm. you know, uh, it, it's, it's a lot of little nuances and range that he reached mm -hmm. um, just about just life in society from the from the, the disenfranchised side. Yeah. And then Biggie was also a very, very uh, powerful figure. He had an awesome voice and he was very descriptive and aggressive yet laid back kind of style. He would articulate a lot of things that were like very heavy, but he would do it in a casual manner. And yeah. it was like, yo, you kind of violent, but it's kind of smooth. Like, you know, like one of my favorite tracks of his, I talk about this on Pop Grits, now available. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, I say, you know, one of my favorite, most thugged out lines of his was is a hook. And he's like, you know, I love it when you call me Big Papa. You got the gun up in your waist, please don't shoot up the place. Why? Which is like, you know, yeah, why would a, you have to beg your friends not to shoot the place up? That and then, is a cool yet violent line. And then they don't even understand like why you would even ask, like, whoa, what you mean? What you yeah. mean? Don't so, <laughs> so with that being said, with that introduction, let's go to a clip right now outlining who we'll be talking about on today's episode. The story of Biggie and Tupac is the story of two great friends who had a misunderstanding, a falling out and became deadly enemies. Their murders were explained as being the result of the rivalry that had grown up between them. This is Biggie. Biggie and Tupac always used to hang out together. Biggie's last album sold over 10 million copies. This is Tupac. He made $80 million in sales in just one year. It was the occasion of Puffy's birthday in 1994. And if you look really closely, you'll see the rarest of footage of Biggie and Tupac hugging on the edge of stage. 
I probably should have warned you guys before I tossed to that clip about how cringeworthy that narrator was. And I've watched some really fascinating documentaries leading up to covering this today. Um, but we're gonna kick off the episode by talking about Tupac Shakur. And then in part two, we're gonna tell you about Biggie. And then in part three, we'll talk about their legacy and some of the theories surrounding their unsolved murders. So let's start with Tupac. So he's born Tupac. Uh, Tupac. He's born June 16th, 1971 in East Harlem, New York. I always assumed because I'd bought an into the manufactured East Coast, West Coast beef that he was from the West Coast, but he was actually born in New York City. And he moved to Marin City, California in 1988. Marin. 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 There yes. you go. You're from California. You got it. This it's is Bay okay. Area. Also, it's you should totally correct me on anything that I am mispronouncing throughout this episode. Sound like that Please. dude in the clip. Yeah. In Marin, in Marine City. Born in Marin City. <laughs> Marin City. <laughs> um, yeah. So Marin. He's born in Marin City, California, 1988. And from a young age, this is a guy that shows an incredible gift for poetry, for dancing, for acting, for music. He's not a one-note guy. His friends have all said that. Um, and he gets signed as a backup dancer for Digital Underground in 1990, and he begins releasing his own work around the same time. He comes out with Tupacalypse Now, which is his first solo record, and that is released on my birthday, November 12th, 1991. And I want to go to a clip right now of this is Tupac's first televised interview to just give you an idea of the man that we're talking about. Yeah, I just wanted to ask Tupac, what has it been like for you being in the business? What has it been like? You heard that Tribe Called Quest song? Record company people are <laughs> It's just a lot of um, smiles, a lot of uh, shaking hands, a lot of everybody giving you their demo, um, a lot of backstabbing. But it's a lot of money, it's a lot of good experience, a lot of travel, a lot of females, and that's good. So you gotta weigh it. All right, Anya, what made Tupac different from other rappers that were out at the time? What set him apart so early on? I think it was funny that you mentioned in his start in hip hop, it, it kind of signals a whole different time frame in rap period. You talking about being a backup dancer for a rap group. That was that was kind of where hip hop was at that point. It was a lot of big production, you know, it wasn't just to a dude rapping to a beat. It was like, you know, it was a couple guys rapping, you had backup dancers, you had background, you had, you know, you had uh Art, you had DJs, you had a whole kind of scene. And so him shifting, he's him finding a way in there as an introduction uh with the with the with the uh, digital underground. Um kind of it's it's kind of funny that, you know, that's where rap was. It wasn't a happy kind of party place, mm -hmm. you know, and it wasn't like an aggressive party place, yeah. kind of like it is now. It's like uh, like it's always been a party music, but the fact that, you know, it was all about kicking it and dancing and drinking yeah. and, and and hanging out with your friends versus now where you know you could kick it and hang out with your friends but yo they be like you know they got songs like yo we don't dance you know what I'm saying we too hard to dance you know it was it was before extra macho kind of took over and so he kind of got in there uh he got in there at a time where there was there was a, a, a there was a void to be filled with with poetry or um heavy perspective based Material and he was also not afraid to back down on social issues and issues that were facing his community. So his um, his mom was a member of the Black Liberation Army and affiliated with the Black Panthers, as I understand. And so he was raised with this sort of heightened awareness of what was going on around him. He felt this sort of responsibility to his community, and um, he wasn't afraid to talk about that in his music. I have a, a clip right now of him talking about wealth disparity and race in America. So let's take a look. There's no black neighborhood, you know what I'm saying, with black people who have the same amount of money as me. You know what I'm saying? There's richer and there's poorer. There's no just, you know, did a movie, got a little bit of money, living okay, black neighborhood. I have to be in a white neighborhood, so I don't fit in. That's hell. It's hell when you can't be around your peers. All my life I grew up around black people, poor people, but I can't live around poor people now because they'll rob me. And why would they rob me? Because they're starving, because there's no money here. But they're telling me, now that I made a little money, I have to move here. So it's not like no one's ever trying to deal with this section. They're just moving away from it. And we're gonna have more stars coming from together, but they're gonna, they're gonna all move this way. You know what I'm saying? So it's like all, all the society is doing is leeching off the ghetto. 
They use the ghetto for their pain, for their sorrow, for their culture, for their music, for their happiness, for their movies, to talk about boys in the hood. You know what I'm saying? I don't want to be another young, I don't want to be 50 years old at a BET, We Shall Overcome um, Achievement Awards. You know what I'm saying? One of the reasons why he was so outspoken too is kind of to, to the credit of that, um, being in Oakland, California, he credits a lot of his spiritual um, awakening um, and awareness uh, that connection, uh, which is Oakland is a city right uh, across the water mm -hmm. from Marin, um, where a lot of the, the, actually the Black Panthers were founded and started. And so I think his connection to Oakland, California kind of uh, put him in that, it, it made, it, it heightened his awareness and sort of sense of responsibility to speak on a lot of mm -hmm. those issues, not just in music, but when, you know, we got you to sit down, I'm gonna tell you, you know, I'm gonna tell you, exactly what I've been hearing, you know, and what I know out in the streets that they're not gonna, people aren't gonna tell you in an interview. And not like the streets, like thug life and all this, but like the actual uh, social economic ramifications of, like you said, using the ghetto as a source, a, a, an expendable kind of source of cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so now I think we can sort of get into the events that led up to his untimely and early demise. So let, let's jump forward a little bit in time. Now we are November 30th, 1994. And something I would like to remind people watching today is that this isn't a biography show. So if you wanna see a full biography on Tupac or Biggie, I would encourage you to do so. But this is about their um, extraordinary lives, but also their extraordinary and fascinating deaths because this is a show called Murder with Friends, just to putting that out there. So we're jumping forward, it's November 1994, and he is currently on trial for, well, weapons possession and also for sodomy. Um, there is some sort of an altercation that happens with a girl in a hotel room, she presses charges. Um, and during this time, uh, he is attacked at Quad Recording Studios. And this is a pivotal point in Tupac's story because he feels strongly that Biggie and uh, Puff Daddy at that time were somehow involved. Can let's, let's talk a little bit about what happened at Quad Recording Studios. He was, um, basically hurting for some money because he was fighting these legal battles. Um, and so he had agreed to do a spot on a song, just a feature uh, for some sum of money. And when he rolls up, there are guys there dressed in army fatigues, uh, some sort of army camouflage thing uh, that are prepared to rob him at gunpoint. They do so. They also shoot him and they steal $40,000 worth of jewelry. Tupac then gets in the elevator, goes up to where he was supposed to be recording, and he comes across Biggie and Puff Daddy and other, you know, uh, Bad Boy Entertainment affiliates who he says were not. Um, concerned, they, they well, mm. I mean, it, to his own uh, account, he says that they didn't, they seemed sort of shocked to see him, that maybe they'd expected him to be dead. So he read that situation um, as an attack that Bad Boy Entertainment had allowed to happen. And then we see that famous image of him coming out of the elevator, middle fingers up, being like, cause he took five bullets. I mean, he took five bullets and he survived that. And then to add, you know, to add to this, December 1994, he is convicted of sex, sexual abuse. So then he serves uh, his time in prison. And during this time, he starts hearing rumors and he starts mulling over Biggie's connection to the shooting at Quad Recording Studio. So I have a clip right now about how these rumors were going on in his head. <laughs> While in jail awaiting a date for his appeal, Tupac began hearing rumors that Biggie not only knew his shooters, but was affiliated with them. With most of his money spent on his family and lawyer's fees, only one person offered to post a $1.4 million bail, Suge Knight. All right, Anya, for people who have never heard of him before, who was Suge Knight? Who was this figure in hip hop and rap at the time? Suge Knight was the CEO of Death Row Records, a subsidiary of uh, Interscope. Mm -hmm. And um, at the time, he had, uh, Suge Knight had sparked a, a feud with Puff Daddy. Mm -hmm. um, at the Source Awards, he was, uh, he was seen as uh, uh, taking shots at Puff Daddy by inviting artists in the audience that don't quote, want the producer dancing all in your videos, end quote. 
you know, to come on over and join Death Row, which was a direct shot uh, at Puff Daddy. And I think also that, you know, the feud between the two of them caused him to align himself with Tupac to kind of pull in this powerful mm -hmm. chess figure, just his chess piece on his board in his grand feud between him and Puff Daddy. Right. Uh, you know, because at the time they were the 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 highest figures of record success, record industry, music industry success mm -hmm. for black folks. It was Puff Daddy and Suge Knight, and you know, above them Barry Gordy. You know what I mean? Right. Uh, so the, I think the real feud was really between Suge Knight and Puff Daddy, mm -hmm. uh, and Suge Knight aligning himself with Tupac, sort of absorbing Tupac. Was a, a power was move. Was a power move, for so, sure. And it is, an, sure. it is an insane power move because uh, Tupac releases Me Against the World, and it goes number one on the Billboard 200 while he's behind bars. Uh, he's released in 1996, and then he starts working actively with Death Row Records. And now we are coming up to when he was shot, which is September 7th, 1996. And because these are unsolved cases that we're talking about today, we are going to fill in the timeline as best as we can, but you know, a lot of this is still sort of uh, up to speculation for exactly what happened. But what we do know um, is that the attack occurred after there had been some sort of a scuffle in Las Vegas between Tupac and a gentleman named Orlando Anderson. They got uh, Tupac jumped Orlando Anderson because he was affiliated with the Southside Crips. Tupac was also a Crip. I don't. I, mean, I can't speculate. I think Shug Knight was with the Bloods. And so, um, I, and a lot of people think that you know Tupac signing with Suge Knight was that was the shift from his uh, socially aware Tupac to his you know thug thug life dark side. Mm -hmm. um, and so he was with that circle. Suge Knight was very active, from what I understand, with gang affiliations. And so, you know. With with Tupac there, I, you know, it was the the the, the chances of him uh, and the frequency of him coming across all manner of nonsense was just heightened, you know. Yeah. Whereas before, like I say, he was a dancer, an art guy, you know. And while he had connections in in streets and, and knew a lot of street characters, he was an individual that sort of could walk on his own. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like. You know, he was the kind of guy that if dudes was planning the, you know, a shootout, he'd be like, "All right, well, I'm gonna catch up with y'all tomorrow." You right. know, and they'd be like, "All right, man, we're gonna do some dirt." We, you know, that's probably got his thing going on. But with Suge, he's like, "Yo, yeah, I'm a ride too." You know what I mean? And it's like, it was a, a bad influence. I think, and I think, I think Suge Knight kind of pushed him, and not it, whether aggressive, like whether intentionally pushed him to to be in the mix with him. He certainly had an environment. That that uh, nurtured uh, his ignorance and wild side and his sort of a confrontational yeah. nature with, so, with with Hennessy and weed and everything else around and also high strung individuals. Yeah. So so here we are. We're in Las Vegas. Uh, they're at the Mike Tyson Bruce Seldon boxing match. Uh, afterwards, they get into a scuffle with Orlando Anderson. And then I want to go to a clip right now of this is Tupac's bodyguard describing the events leading up to the attack. We came to a stoplight, which was Colville. As Tupac's bodyguard follows in the car behind, the convoy inches forward. And as usual, Tupac draws the attention of his fans. Then, suddenly, out of nowhere, a white Cadillac. As they got closer to the BMW, the arm came out and the gun just started firing. Shug's car is hit with a spray of bullets. Four of them rip into Tupac's body. Another grazes Shug Knight's head. And after the Cadillac shot into the car, I thought they were dead. My reaction was to run up to the car and instead the car took off. So following that interaction, Tupac will die in the hospital September 13th, 1996. And his murder is still officially unsolved. And we're only getting into this story because in part two, we're gonna tell you about his counterpart, the notorious B.I.G. We'll see you then.